Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, I have, um, in fact, I have two papers to present uh, this morning, if you notice. One is uh, on the Washington Accord and the other one is on the ECAPS projects that is being led by the Federation of Engineering Institutions of Islamic Countries. So let's start off with the Washington Accord. Um, basically, no, let me see. Um, Krishna. Right. Now, everybody is joining the bandwagon. Uh, the MRT or Mass Rapid Transit System or rather, it's basically about the mutual recognition. We are talking about globalization, where everybody has to, whether we like it or not, the global world is open to everybody. So there's no more boundaries, technically, although there are still boundaries between countries, but as far as engineering services are concerned, we are actually doing it at a global level. It could be operating in Malaysia, in the United States, they are also working in Australia at the same time. It's one company looking at various places. Now, there are a lot of agencies, organizations that are involved in all these activities. Right? For example, in Asia, we have the Asian Federation of Engineering Organization, AFIO. There is the FIAP, which is slightly bigger going into the Asia side of it. And there's also the Federation of Engineering Institution of Islamic Countries. There's the World Federation. There's the NABIA, which is the network of engineering education for the Asian countries. Of course, not to forget the International Engineering Alliance, which is at the moment headquartered at New Zealand. So all these global initiatives, I mean, there are various of them that you can actually participate and they are mostly similar in nature because being engineers, right, we know basically what are the requirements and everybody knows that professional qualification requires the sort of experience which is substantially equivalent to many of us being practiced at our own countries. And similarly, engineering education. There's not much different if you can say, probably it's just a niche that some programs may actually have. Right. Coming to the accord models, there are quite a number of models here, but I would like just to highlight uh, a few here. Uh, basically, the first one, you could see that the European Union, where they have this URACE program, right? And this URACE program <coughs> The, based on the Bologna Declaration. So they've gone to a three plus two system, the first cycle and the second cycle education, three years of bachelor's and two years of master's. But if you look at the way that it is being organized, it is being done by the government. It's government-led. So it pushes the, all the engineering institutions, basically. Whereas the second one is non-governmental. That's the International Engineering Alliance. So it requires participation from bodies that are independent, accrediting bodies that are independent, independent of the government. Independence from the influence of the government means to say being independent, they can ensure that quality education could be provided without any political interference. Now, this is basically the model that is being used by the IEA. And the third one is the Federation of Engineering Institution, which I will deliberate in my second paper. But basically, the ECAPS project that has been launched by the Federation is all about examination, qualification, accreditation and professional systems. It's the complete picture 
bringing in from the beginning of engineering education right up to professional qualification. And you'll see that uh, Professor Abang will be talking more on the professional qualification, and I'll be talking more about the engineering education. Now, people talk about Washington Accord. <laughs> I've been asked to talk about Washington Accord. Maybe they're thinking that Washington Accord is trying to actually rule the world. That means the states are the United States hegemony. Uh, some people thought about it. But actually, it was launched in about 1989. And Malaysia was also invited at that time, together with Singapore. But we made the decision at that time not to participate for whatever reasons. Those were the days they thought it was not that important, probably. So in the end, only six countries started it. That was way back. Even though the signing of the accord was not in Washington, really, it was done in United Kingdom, in London. Um, but because the idea was mooted in Washington, therefore it was called Washington Accord when they signed it. So the International Engineering Alliance, really, um, the name itself came into the picture in 2007, even though it started about 1989. But it was only called the International Engineering Meeting. So they had meetings every year where all the signatories will actually participate. And the development of IEA really started here, you could see that when it was signed by six organizations, it started as a Washington Accord. And eventually, it developed into other accords and agreements. The education as well as the professional systems. That means the professional qualification for professional engineers. And the last one, which was in 2015, it was the technicians. So the IEA, houses not just engineers, it houses also the engineering technologists as well as engineering technicians. And not only that, it looks at the education for engineers, engineering technologists and engineering technicians. So it is a very wide-based kind of organization when we look at the spectrum of what we call as the engineering team. So that's how the engineering team was actually formed. Now, if you look at the International Engineering Alliance, the Education Accord, so that's the Education Accord and the Practice Agreement. Under them, you have Washington, Sydney, and Dublin. That's a four-year, normally it has to be a four-year program. And the Three-year program is meant for Sydney after 12 years of schooling, right? Expectation minimum is 12 years of schooling for both of them. Whereas the Dublin Accord is only for two years, these are meant for the technicians. And when it comes to the practice agreement, there are four of them. One is the IPAA, where Professor Abang will be speaking on. Then the APEC and GDS, which is similar to the IPAA. They started with the Asia-Pacific Economic region and then the IETA which is more of the international engineering technologies agreement uh, this is uh, the three-year equivalent and the AIET is meant for the technician which was in 2015 quite recent and of course there are others if it's, as you can see and some are more loosely it's more of a loose network trying to bring people, for example, like Nabia, they do not compete with Washington Accord, but what they did in Asia is that they helped the countries to get into all these accord. But it is a standalone organization meant for Asia. So all in all, as you can see, what we are doing here is trying to build the team, which is engineers, engineering technologies, and engineering technician. And Definitely, when we talk about them, we have to think about the pathway. So the education pathway, for example, for technicians, the TVET area or the skill-based area probably would be leading to technicians 
and you have the technologies, could be the technical education with the diploma and the bachelor's of engineering technology, and you can also articulate into bachelor's of engineering technology from your diploma and goes to become engineering technologist. And of course, you could also go to become technician despite coming from this region. Now, as engineers, there is no compromise, right? There is the requirements. The entry requirement has got to be maintained, whereby the bachelor's of engineering is the minimum, and it has to be a four-year requirement. Now, there may be, for example, in this particular case where one can articulate into a bachelor's of engineering, but it has to be a four-year program, regardless. And of course, you can also move laterally, depending on how the programs are being organized. Now, the Washington Accord is really a mutual recognition, coming back to Washington Accord. But it says here, it's key to practice engineering at the professional level. That means if you're going for a professional qualification, engineering, professional engineering qualification, therefore, the Washington Accord is appropriate. But if you're thinking about, you know, the system is not important, then probably it doesn't matter. So the idea of Washington Accord is more of to make sure that in order to practice engineering, the education level must be appropriate at the Washington Accord or higher. And that would actually assist mobility of professional engineers. But of course, it's not only assisting mobility of professional engineers, it also allows graduate engineers to move around as well by virtue that their engineering qualification is considered as substantially equivalent. Now that's an added advantage. Uh, you're not going to be re-examined by those signatory countries who actually participated in them. And as far as Washington Accord is concerned, because it's been benchmarked, according to that standard. And that's the reason why these 20 signatories plus five provisional members, at the moment there are 20 full signatory members, and five being provisional. Amongst them, they would recognize mutually, and graduates will not be re-examined again if they are going for their professional qualification. So these are the 20, as, as you can see, the earlier ones, the six countries that started it in 1989. And of course, the previous speaker was saying there are three countries uh, from the Islamic world that became the signatory of Washington Accord, Malaysia, Pakistan, and Turkey. Uh, in order of Malaysia, Turkey, and Pakistan, really, in 2009. Remember, I mentioned just now, we were invited in 1989, but we got into it in, 19, in 2009, about 20 years. So, decision made earlier could be very detrimental in terms of the progress, as what we noticed 20 years before we could actually be part of the signatory. The provisional signatories are Bangladesh, Costa Rica, Mexico, Philippines, and Chile. And they're all interested, as well as applying for the uh, provisional status. Myanmar, Nigeria, Thailand, Indonesia, and Saudi Arabia. Interested in applying, some of them. I know for sure that uh, Myanmar, Nigeria, and Thailand, they're going for this year for their provisional status because Malaysia is actually mentoring them towards the provisional status. Indonesia is at the moment being mentored by Japan, JABI, Japan Engineering Education Association. And at the moment, Saudi Arabia, we can ask the representative from Saudi Arabia who is around today, uh, what's the situation like? Right, so the next uh, Islamic country is going to be Bangladesh. It's not going to be this year. Most likely, it's going to be next year. Right? I was. Five, five yeah. 
And the Washington Accord, if you look at the executive committee, who actually makes decision? And there's only two person there, right? At the moment, the chair and the deputy chair, chair coming from Taipei, and the deputy chair coming from Australia. So they are the one who makes the first decision, the clearance, one could say, before the whole system can be implemented and approved on. So, but they are part of the IEA governing body. So basically, the chair of all the governing body comes from the United States at the moment, who is also the chair of the Sydney Court. So all the agreements, so they have the uh, two of which actually represents each of the agreements, and all of them becomes the governing board. So the expectations. So basically, the expectation is that they wanted an outcome-based system. So you must have an outcome-based accreditation system. Beginning 2019, you have no choice to come in, you must have it. The program must have adequate breadth and depth of an engineering program. Complex problem must be able to be demonstrated by those programs. That means to say students are actually engaging in solving complex problems. Pedagogy and assessment has got to be modified to look at this new approach of outcome base. It's not going to be lectures like what you, you're listening today. And improvement is going to be an important agenda, and that's where quality is the case. And so, if you think about what's the objective of the programs, there are about 12 graduate attributes being stipulated to be completed in all the four years of education. So I'm just putting them there. We will explain them later on. But of course, together with the extracurricular and university experience. And all these are basically called the Washington Accord attributes or program outcomes. And this, you have no choice but to comply with. So the knowledge profile is also being mentioned. So there are eight knowledge profile that you have to make sure that is available in your curriculum, and all of them has got to be packed in that four years. It never says how much. It is non-prescriptive in that sense. You will have to determine based on the program objectives. What do you want your graduates to be eventually, within three to five years? Right? Complex problem requires high taxonomy level of learning, and it, it also requires complex engineering activities to be implemented at the universities. So in conclusion, there is no turning back really as far as the IEA is concerned. They're moving forward with outcome base, and the IEA is basically spanning through all the six continents except the Antarctica, where nobody is around, I suppose, no universities, although there are research centers there. Benchmark standards, will keep on improving, that's pushing the standards, that's where quality is all about. And it is non-prescriptive, nevertheless, and it requires an independent NGO. Means to say it shouldn't be government-led. So independency, of course, can be interpreted as you're not getting money from the government. So you are actually self-reliance. So thank you very much. That's about all.